First, I'd like to introduce to you Aurélie Botta. Aurélie is a researcher in the Green Research Unit of the Centre de Coopération Internationale en Recherche Agronomique pour le Développement, CIRAD, in France. She's also the coordinator of the Resilience 2014 conference, the Montpellier conference that Rajul mentioned that took place last week. Aurélie. Thank you. So, hi everybody, and first, uh, I would like to thank the Resilience 2020 uh, organizer for having uh, invited the CIRAD um, for this very interesting conference. And uh, actually, I'm one of the coordinator uh, with Francois Bousquet. Um, and in the name of the scientific committee of the Resilience 2014 conference, I'm here to report from the third edition of uh, International Science and Policy Conference on the resilience of the social, social and ecological uh, system. Um, this series of conferences uh, is associated with the Resilience Alliance Network, which is a research organization created in 1999, comprised of scientists and practitioners for many, from many disciplines who collaborate to explore the dynamic of social and ecological systems. They have provided a foundation for sustainable development policy and practices for the last 15 years. One of the challenges to emerge from previous uh, SES resilience conferences was the need to reinforce the link, the multiple link, between resilience thinking and the developing development issues. So this dialogue was the overarching theme of uh, last week's conference in Montpellier. 940 participants and uh, other stakeholders from more than 60 different countries uh, attended that conference, and I know that few of them are here with us this evening. Um, the first thing I would like to report is about the definition. I know that a lot of people here are a little bit tired with that exercise, so I will basically focus on two aspects that uh, of uh, SES resilience that partly differ from some of the definition that I've heard here. The first one is that uh, socio-ecological resilience includes the multiple link between society and their environment. These links may damp, increase shocks and uh, pressure on our society, favor or prevent adaptive and, and transformative capacity. And uh, I'm, th I'm thinking, for example, about food web feedbacks or long-term dynamics, such as those involved in soil biochemistry. And that type of, of interaction are sometimes, and actually most of the time, kind of overlooked by development approach. The second thing that I would like to highlight is the fact that thinking in terms of SES uh, resilience is about considering a plurality of trajectories. Oops, sorry. And um, by not picking a single optimal, optimal option, we let uh, once let the possibility for the society to develop emergent cap adaptive uh, adaptation dynamics to unknown perturbation and change to come. Um, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow shock may be different from current shocks. And uh, potentially to decide to take a different trajectory. Um, so in addition to the discussion about how to cope with shock and recover from crisis that I've heard a lot discussed here, we add the idea of how to seize crisis as opportunity to actually transform drastically unwanted systems such as a poverty trap. Resilience 2014 put a clear emphasis on transformation as one of the missing elements in the current debate. The second point that I would like to make is about the necessity to move beyond advocacy. There are still uh, some unanswered questions, and resilience is not the, the panacea. Resilience, SES, resilience tools and approaches have been developed with a systemic approach to deal with complex systems. 
and to address certain aspects of changes, such as the link between short-term and long-term, the link across spatial scales, uh, including social and ecological dynamics, and um, so the, the type of, of uh, a tool and approaches that were debated and presented uh, last, week, last week were about participatory approaches to engage with the various decision levels and social network that need to be associated, such as the prospective scenario, methods to detect early warning of tipping points, or cross-sectorial approach allowing to tackle uh, interdependency between issues such as food and energy uh, security, or food security and land use management. Uh, but other aspects of changes, such as social justice, equity, and associated power issue, are still not fully in addressed by these tools. And uh, there, are some, there are some ongoing progress, but we need to cross resilience thinking with other frame of knowledge, such as political ecology and political economics, as it has been mentioned yesterday. So it's one of the frontier for future research and development that has been uh, identified last week. Another point is that certain development issues have been more investigated than others. We had several examples of concrete application of resilience thinking in terms of um, how to address disaster management and adaptation to climate change. But um, the added value of resilience thinking to address poverty issue is still to be shown, at least from our perspective. And uh, for us, resilience building is not a substitute for, pover for poverty alleviation. These two first points illustrate a general debate about the use of resilience thinking. The first, first uh, view on it is to consider it as an overarching framework, and that's what I heard mostly here, and a framework that encompassed the different, the different scale, the different sector, embracing humanitarian and development issues and action, and uh, it's very attractive and, and seducting because it, it's offering missing links, but it also holds in itself potential danger, a danger that by making resilience thinking the new buzzword we speak about, uh, that speak about everything, we are not specific and we are mixing so many uh, things that basically it's the open door for uh, misunderstanding and instrumentalization. And uh, some economists, and uh, not economists, sorry, sociologists and anthropologists have already accused uh, resilience thinking to be used to advocate business as usual and uh, old development approach. So, Maybe we have to be also careful to not, uh, for, we have to be careful that resilience thinking doesn't take the same path as sustainable development, where now we are trying to reintroduce sustainability in sustainable development project. Um, another, uh, an extra point is coming back very actually much in agreement with what is discussed here, is coming back to the specific question of implementation. Uh, besides, or in addition to the, the, the question of uh, the idea of adopting a systematic approach, resilience implementation is need to pay, we need to pay a specific attention to democratic aspects, including accountability and responsiveness, and I think that will be one of the theme of tomorrow's uh, side event, or power session, and the importance of the context and the need for adaptive management. And finally, uh, finally, the necessity to uh, the necessity and the associated difficulty to monitor and evaluate resilience was also the object of several sessions of last week. Um, so we need the, the, the conclusion of, of last week is that we need to move beyond the debate between measuring resilience as an outcome or evaluating resilience as a process because both metrics and process evaluation are needed and complementary. But we need to be clear about the aim of each set of indicators. I will refer you to uh, the presentation by Christophe Benet and Luca Alinovi uh, on the metrics and on the poster that is displayed on the screen on, in the corridor about Practitioner Workbook of Resilience Alliance and the associated database and community of practices. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, 
I will, I will mention the role of science, um, recognizing that science is not always done in research center and by academics, but science happened in the field with practitioner and include a diversity of knowledge. Panelists point out the first day that the relative lack of private sector participant to this conference, but there is also a large community of scientists conceptualizing, developing and testing uh, tools and approaches in the field and that could bring extra insight on that conference and that could also take uh, a lot from how you, um, you are actually framing the, the issues of development. So, uh, a last word about the risk of dogmatism and instrumentation, as we should try to avoid the tyranny of learning of, and, and, and reflect on who has to learn and who tell who to learn what. So, thank you for your attention.